Okay, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you are joining this webinar. Welcome to LMU's special lecture series on international business and regional studies. My name is Yong Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management and director of Center for Asian Business and also the Center for International Business Education of Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. Today's program is funded by DK Kim Foundation a gracious benefactor of the Center for Asian Business for past six years and sponsored by the LMU Center for International Business Education. The Center for Asian Business was established in 1995 to promote better understanding between the US and Asian countries through multiple channels, including international business courses, faculty research grants, student scholarships, special lectures, and movie screenings. LMU is among the 16 universities in the country who received a very prestigious Cyber Grants Awards from the U.S. Department of Education. The LMU Sci serves as regional as well as national resources to students, faculty, and business practitioners through international business and area study education, foreign language training, and research capacities. We live in a digital age where practically everything we need to do in our daily lives can, can be done online or from the palm of our hands. Most countries are convinced that their future economic prosperity will depend on how well they succeed in transitioning to digital societies. Digitalization is helping to transform economies by enhancing competitiveness and productivity. Asia is leading this trend by increasingly using big data and developing online platforms and expanding e-commerce. A digital company aligns the use of digital technology across all activities, people, and process in order to do business digitally, gaining more efficiency, agility, and better response to market exchanges. Before we start the program, um, I'd like to introduce uh, our speakers. It is my great pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. First, Dr. Jonathan Wurzel. Uh, he's the director of McKenzie Global Institute, McKenzie's business and economics research arm and senior partner. He also leads McKenzie's city special initiative and he's responsible for convening Mackenzie's work with city, regional, and national authorities in more than 40 geographies around the world. He has advised national governments in Asia on improving the environment for foreign investors, national energy policy and economic development strategies, and also works in the private sector, most often on issues relating to corporate strategies, operations, and organization. Dr. Wetzel has led numerous research efforts on economic trends, including growth and productivity, urbanization, affordable housing, energy and sustainability, e-commerce and economic impact of the internet, as well as on productivity growth and economic development in China and Asia. He has published widely in both Chinese and international publications, has written five books on China. Our next speaker, Mr. Kevin Cloudon, he's the Milken Institute's chief global strategist. He specializes in the study of key factors that underlie the development of competitive regional economies, such as clusters of innovation, patterns of trade and investment and concentration of skilled labor. On a national level, he's heavily involved in trade exports and capital access for small businesses, including serving as chair of the US Department of Commerce Trade Finance Advisory Council. He has also been highly engaged in California's economy and workforce, including advising and writing on numerous subjects relating to California's workforce, technology, manufacturing, and export issues. His area of expertise include technology-based development, entrepreneurship, and digitalization of the global economy, including trade infrastructure, media, and entertainment. Jonathan and Kevin, thank you so much for joining the panel out of your very busy schedule. I know that uh, you are out of the country. Um, Jonathan, uh, you are joining from Seoul, Korea, and Kevin is now in Washington, DC, attending the uh, meeting hosted by US Export Import Bank. 
Now, I'd like to ask each of you to give a short presentation on the webinar topic for about 10 minutes. Then we'll start a panel discussion for about 15 minutes or so before taking questions from the audience. Jonathan, would you like to go first? Can you give us a definition of digital economy and maybe explain a driving force behind the di digitalization of the Asian economy? Yes, my pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Peck, and a uh, uh, pleasure to be with all of you as well. Um, so I'm going to just talk, unlike many McKinsey presentations, you might be expecting a lot of slides. Um, I could use those, <laughs> but uh, in the sake of uh, communicating, I'll, I'll, I'll try to make my, my, my thoughts as, as clear as I can. Uh, so a digital economy is, uh, from our point of view, there are at least four four ways to think about it, four ways to measure it. Um, the first and the one that I think we'll spend most of our time talking about it is simply transactions. So I mean, a digital economy shows a lot of digital transactions and be they uh, monetary, uh, commerce, uh, or more technical, I think uh, you know, simply uh, information uh, data flow uh, that that's that's one metric for what a digital economy is. It has a lot of digital transactions. Um, obviously, e-commerce is uh, is perhaps the most obvious one in terms of measurement, but by no means it by no means the only one. But just think about bandwidth, essentially utilized bandwidth. Uh, secondly, a digital economy has people who can use this technology. Uh, digitalized people, if you will. And that doesn't necessarily mean only an avatar, uh, but it simply means people who have the capacity, the skills, the training, um, the knowledge to be effective uh, in a digital economy. And you could perhaps measure that obviously through educational knowledge and certification of some sort, uh, graduate degrees perhaps, but also in terms of skills and professions, the occupations that are digitalized in nature. Um, I would point at many uh, jobs in the media, for example, uh, obviously a lot of jobs in ICT sector. So the second factor is a digitalized economy has digitalized people. Uh, thirdly, uh, a digitalized economy makes a lot of digital investments that uh, we cannot get away without having a set of uh, uh, R&D facilities, uh, the hardware, the broadband infrastructure, um, a digitalized economy re relies on the ability of companies uh, and the public sector to make a substantial and ongoing investment in digital infrastructure, as well as in the software and services associated with that infrastructure. So we can measure that simply in terms of investments uh, and potentially in terms of companies, the number of uh, digital companies, and finally R&D expenditures. So that's a third aspect. So a digitalized economy is uh, makes digital investments. And then finally, uh, a digital economy, from our point of view, has the ability to generate new digital knowledge, um, that it creates its own next generation, if you will. Uh, and so digital, a digitalized economy has a lot of digitalized patents. It has, uh, it has startups. Um, it has people who are on the cutting edge of the new uh, digital idea, whatever it is. So that's uh, a bit softer, but I think the patents number is pretty hard. Uh, so those are the four aspects of what a digital economy is. It has digital transactions, it has digitalized people, it has digital investments, and it, may, and it creates new digital knowledge all the time. So that's our definition. Uh, and uh, we've gone around and, and put create an index together around the world. And it's quite interesting to see how economies vary uh, across these different factors, with some being a little ahead in some and behind in others. Uh, but yes, of course, these the overall, there's a fairly strong correlation across those four factors. Uh, and certainly so, and with that correlation, we do see the ability to accelerate productivity growth. So to the question of did, what are the factors uh, that underlie digitalization's growth uh, and you know to where where do we see it, in particular the role of Asia, um, I think we might want to sort of focus on to say like Asia has embraced this digital revolution and has very high levels of digital adoption. Uh, many Asian economies have developed a world leading presence in everything from electronics, uh, leveraging its ex excellence in manufacturing, 
um, and as well it, it's very large pools of science, technology, engineering, and math graduates. Uh, but it goes beyond electronics, of course, now. And we'll come, let me come on to that in a minute. But what we think is, you know, I'm going to highlight two particular factors that have under that have underpinned Asia's digitalization as a case study and how this works. Um, and the first is its consumers. Uh, Asia is extremely adaptable digital consumers are very enthusiastic about these technologies. Uh, you can see this in the number of internet users, uh, the the uh, age is about half the global total at this stage. Uh, broadband penetration in Asian economies is higher than in, in pretty much anywhere else. Uh, the mobile payments, uh, you know, that 69% of all e-commerce transactions are executed using mobile, which is a lot higher than, than it is elsewhere. So it's showing that China, Asia has, and China have gone to a mobile first model. It's all because the Asian economies, the Asian consumers are simply much more comfortable. They're leapfrogging uh, to a digital future. Um, they are, and you know, could argue that's because the offline alternative is just worse. Uh, but regardless, I mean, they're go they're already going there. Um, the other part, another big factor on in Asia's digitalized growth and what drives digitalization uh, is uh, the role of the public sector. Um, so the governments of Asia have often you know, been very forward leaning in their adoption and importantly, their sponsorship. So if we look at India, you know, we have ideas such as the digital ID program as a strategic tool for delivering government services, managing budgets, increasing financial inclusion. Uh, Malaysia has been forming digital free trade zones. Uh, and, you know, I can remember 30 years ago in here in Korea, where I am now talking about RFID. Uh, and sort of creating RFID zones here. So the government has been at this for a long time. And I, I think COVID was in fact another big accelerator of government action that uh, as Asian governments realized that if they wanted to uh, de deploy uh, or they wanted to actually live up to their promises around lives and livelihoods, this would be a big requirement would be for digitalization and uh, digital platforms and, and other technology-based toolkits. If I look at, you know, uh, the a Asian Development Bank says that, you know, that that's the way in which, you know, the, the bounce back from the pandemic can happen. Uh, at Ping, you know, if I look at uh, Ping An, uh, the, the Chinese insurance company, these guys would say that their AI and their machine learning investments are what allowed them uh, to grow their insurance division through COVID and beyond, uh, while not while, while suffering from uh, you know the the effects of the pandemic. So, I, mean, I think that there's quite a lot of sort of push from government from large companies in Asia to be technology be, be digital to be technology enabled. So, final point, uh, just looking forward. I mean, let's, let's be clear: Asia doesn't know everything about everything. Uh, there's a lot of white space out there, and uh, Asia is actually not technologically sufficient. So one of the other factors I think that accounts for the rapid rise of digitalization in a place like Asia or elsewhere is the idea that the environment is relatively open to technological influences from outside the area. Uh, so flow, flow is critical here. Uh, and I think that we've seen a lot of that in, in Asia, but also el elsewhere. And now it's really, again, a new game that we have a new set of technologies. We call them transversal technologies because they cut across. And uh, that would, of course, include AI, quantum, cloud. Uh, there's no clear leaders in this globally. So uh, the next game is still to be played in digitalization. Uh, it will go to those who can harness the power of the market, the role of government and the openness to technologies from wherever they may come. So that's those are my those are my remarks, Dr. Paik. Uh, look forward to the Q and A. Okay, thanks so much, Jonathan. I think that your presentation is to certainly help us to understand better the backgrounds uh, and current state of the uh, acceleration of the digitalization in Asia. Uh, now, Kevin, uh, could you please follow on Jonathan's talk and maybe that. I think you can focus on the digitalization of the three leading uh, economies in Asia, namely China, Japan, and Korea. These are the top three trading partners in Asia, not only for the US at a national level, but also for the state of California. Well, my pleasure. And I mean, obviously, it's a hard act to follow coming after Jonathan, but I will do my best. <laughs> and 
I, I think actually going ahead and making the point in terms of talking about China, Japan, and Korea, and I would actually just even also want to bring up even beyond those in contrast, you know, what's going on in Southeast Asia as well. And the reason for that is that one of the key things in understanding uh, adapt, adaptation, adoption, and key factors relating to a digital economy and digitization is market opportunity uh, in particular within the countries in the fact that the early movers in digital have very often found themselves in the way that evolution is happening in the economy, the way that evolution is happening in terms of services, in terms of e-commerce, in terms of digital infrastructure, that the early movers often find themselves outpaced. One, companies that in countries that have followed those strategies and where they were pushing for success have, find themselves being able to embrace key economic moments that they have been having. Uh, and in fact, we see this sequentially with the fact that when it comes to digitization, Japan had been an early mover very much in looking at computers, looking at digital and portable technologies, mobile phones, various other elements, as a way to essentially assert Japanese economic strength, resilience, pushing forward in terms of R&D, and moving into key spaces. And in many ways, Japan had established a series of leading positions in a number of technologies ranging from everything from digitization in music, cell phones, did, uh, computing power, including uh, establishing and running a number of the world's great supercomputers. But uh, there was a lack of penetration in some respects in terms of digital commerce, digital payments, and otherwise, even though they did establish uh, a number of uh, a couple of very successful online shopping platforms for consumers, but in terms of business to business and various kinds of payments, that did not penetrate readily into the wider economy. In fact, Japan has noted uh, and in fact struggled. Um, and the Japanese government has recognized this, that not only digital payments, but even credit card payments and, and what we consider in the U.S. and in California as standard forms of uh, payments and structures outside of the major cities in Japan has lagged tremendously. And numerous communities still operate on a cash-only basis. Uh, Japan actually had to move towards digital paperwork and had massive resistance in uh, moving away from more traditional and trusted forms. And so when Jonathan talks about that issue of trust and the population trusting in it, Japan has actually been a laggard in that regard. South Korea has actually had moved in ahead of Japan in numerous ways, not only in terms of Samsung's leadership, but numerous other companies. We've seen this in the electronic side. We've seen this in mobile phone side, even if LG itself has faltered from its previous leading position. we've But we have seen a number of cases where in what were the next generation of technologies and in terms of broadband penetration, no one has done it better than South Korea. South Korea has moved online in terms of entertainment. It's moved online in terms of numerous uh, transactional elements, but it's much more of what we consider a traditional computer-based broadband in a number of the different elements in, and electronic payments that initial in technologies that South Korea originally looked like it was going to be leading in, and for a while was, it has lost the leadership and has lost the penetration uh, elements in many ways to China. And in not only that in terms of China, but we're also seeing this particularly in Vietnam, we're seeing this in Malaysia and Indonesia, and particularly in various parts of Southeast Asia. And among many reasons for this is that as each generation of technology has come along, and as people basically missed the prior generation, they've had a fundamental reason to be invested in digital infrastructure and utilizing digital technologies to fill a void in many cases, a financial and transactional void within the populations, and to create and utilize an infrastructure that was fundamentally lacking otherwise. One thing that's really important to understand that with China is that China in particular, who lacked a broad penetration of 
banks and various commerce platforms and transactional elements that could span the very incredibly very large geography and tremendous population of the country and to penetrate outside the major cities was an incredible platform and opportunity for a number of innovative companies, particularly coming out of the, the southern and coastal regions. And these private technology companies, such especially as Tencent with WeChat, WeChat Pay, Alibaba with Alipay and the Alibaba e-commerce platform, Weibo and various others, is that they were able to expand into this marketplace because the infrastructure and the competition didn't really exist. And the catch on this is that they became in, and became so significant and dominant that in many ways, there is a reaction from the Chinese government, not only to them and their position, but also to the dominant role that these private sector companies were playing in the marketplace. We've even seen some restrictions that have come in in the insurance market. We've seen it in terms of concerns about outflow of capital and a disproportionate influence on the economy. But even with some of that pushback and restrictions actually happening, we are still have, seeing China in many ways as being the great global leader in mobile payments and being able to move to that system because the previous infrastructure wasn't particularly there. Even though China did develop its own credit card in the case of uh, union of uh, union pay, Ultimately, their great successes come from mobile payments, and that is the model that we are actually seeing a number of other countries particularly looking at and aiming towards, And but in, in, not just in terms of the mobile payments themselves, but also in terms of the e-commerce platforms, where China, not only with Alibaba, but with numerous, um, numerous others, was developing platforms for business-to-business -business transactions, not just business-to-consumer. And, and how that lays works into trade is incredibly important in where that plays in for us in California and where we look at the next wave in terms of the various elements and things that drive us forward from a competitive standpoint, that also is incredibly significant. When we look at Southeast Asia as well, and just to add to that, is that Singapore is ultimately the, the trendsetter and leader in terms of not only a full ado a adoption of numerous digital technologies, including an initiative to try and get rid of passports entirely going out of the country. But it's also been a key in terms of digital transactions between financial services, digital looking at digital agreements between with numerous other countries, and trying to create the standards and infrastructure because it's such a small country that it will allow its businesses and various and com countries and companies doing business with them to spread these standards much more broadly. Okay, thanks, Kevin. I think that was very helpful in making some interesting comparison uh, among the between these uh, three leading economies in Asia. That you explained that uh, in a nutshell that the why uh, China is ahead of Korea and Japan. But I come back to that issue later. Uh, so let me begin with a few questions. First, uh, I'd like to address to Jonathan. Jonathan, um, you highlighted that, you know, four different aspects of uh, the digitalization. So in order to do it, the technology transformation is critical in accelerating digitalization or digitalization of the economy. Are there any areas that Asian companies still fall behind, uh, either the US or Europe, in terms of their technological capabilities? which might hinder their progress into the digital economy in the future. Uh, sorry, let me make sure that I'm on. Uh, yes, uh, so to, uh, to, to, uh, to try to start tackling this, as I started to say that the uh, Asian economies by no means are self-sufficient. Um, in fact, that's the nature of a global economy, that it is interdependent and that other places do some things better than you do, so you should take advantage of that it's comparative advantage. So, um, so by no means is Asia sort of totally self sufficient. Um, but that that said, let's start by the reality that Asia is very clearly uh, the center um, of the 21st century economy. 
um, broadly defined, that Asia will be the part of the, pl the place in the world where the majority of investments are made, where the largest markets are, uh, and where the leading technologies will be developed. So as a region, now Asia itself is everything from Japan and Korea to Australia to India, and it encompasses you know maybe half of the planet's landmass uh, and uh, the majority of its economic growth, uh, GDP in total, and uh, and increasingly pop and historically actually population not so much going forward, uh, but uh, so it's a vast continent and expanse. It's not unrealistic, not unsurprising, perhaps, um, that it should be the center of that technological change. So, but where is it that Asia lags, um, is your question. And I think there are a couple of things. First of all, um, there are a lot of foundational technologies uh, that Asia does not currently yet have. I mean, uh, China is, is no Asian country has yet manufactured wide body aircraft. Uh, for example, uh, that uh, in semiconductors, while South Korea and Taiwan are global powerhouses in the production of of, uh, of memory, uh, not really uh, able to design those chips. So semi US still quite leading in terms of uh, chip design. Uh, and in fact, if we look at you know overall sort of the rate of imports and exports of intellectual property, China, Asia in particular, China. Um, is a massive importer of intellectual property. So on our sort of four aspects, sort of the, while the transactions are very strong in, in Asia, uh, and I would argue that the raw, that the, the STEM graduates, again, is another strength of Asia. But if we look at sort of leading edge PhDs and uh, in particular disciplines, and AI, for example, the majority of those people are not in Asia. They are some. They are usually in the U.S. or or Europe, especially at the very leading edge, sort of the top researchers globally. And they're going to these other places or the U.S. because that's where they feel they have better opportunities to work with their colleagues in most cases. Uh, and th so that is a that is a challenge for Asia is how to attract really the best and the and the most leading edge global talent back to or in Asia in many cases or just to Asia period. Uh, and I think that uh, the other, so that's one aspect where Asia needs to catch up a little bit. Uh, and then uh, knowledge itself. I mean, while the patents are are, are growing by leaps and bounds, as we know, um, the quality of those patents uh, varies a lot. Um, recently, we've seen a lot improve, much improvement in in AI related, but there are plenty of places, uh, bio life sciences, for example, um, where the uh, Asian the quality of the Asian knowledge. Um, is not at the, at the same level as if you would find in the US or Europe. So, I mean, I think those are some examples that Asia is not yet the leader everywhere. Um, it may never be. In fact, it would be strange if it was. Um, it is a comp competitive world uh, and that there is still some catch up to be done around the fundamentals, particularly around talent and to, to some extent around knowledge. Okay, great, thank you. Um... Both of you mentioned actually that trust should be embedded in a society to keep moving digitalization forward. It was quite interesting to note that China, a country still considered to be an emerging economy, it seems to be ahead of Japan and Korea, developed economies in digitalization. Kevin, you mentioned that the, it may have to do with the lack of previous uh, you know, infrastructure that actually helps the China adopt the so-called leapfrogging strategy. Would you please elaborate on the main reasons for the China's such a strong position in digital transformation of its economy? Do you see any cultural influence here? Well, I think, yes. It, well, here's what it, I mean, and, and this is something I think it's very important to recognize in some of the distinctions in China is that you had going back to uh, Deng Xiaoping when he when he was the leader of China, a very deliberate decision was made to actually encourage the entrepreneurial nature and the active uh, the active uh, adoption of technologies, looking for angles in, in global business that came particularly focused on the coast in the south. If you look at it, if you basically look at 
uh, Shanghai, maybe in Hangzhou, and then down towards uh, Fujian, and particularly Guangdong province, that you had a, a history and a center of uh, within the population of taking more risks, of being more willing to be innovative and entrepreneurial from a business standpoint. And one of the things I want to draw the distinction there, however, and also in note to what Jonathan was talking about, this doesn't necessarily mean in terms of research and development, this doesn't necessarily mean in terms of the, uh, the, the acceptance of risk and failure that you particularly see in the U.S. and in California, which is why a number of key people move overseas, and why, ironically enough, that you saw in the case of Alibaba, where Jack Ma and others actually went and solicited funding originally from companies like Yahoo and numerous other American investors, because even though the policies were set in place that enabled China to uh, in China to embrace these technologies and grow, in many cases, the capital wasn't always there, especially from a uh, leadership that was coming from private capital and not necessarily from state-owned enterprises. And that's an important distinction to be made, is that you had a clear opportunity where the government was encouraging and enabling, in some cases, creating not monopolies, but a small number of sort of national champions and encouraging them. And this includes companies like Huawei and others, and allowing them to just develop and flourish as well as using the buying power of the Chinese government, utilizing various elements to reward them and help to expand and to become larger levels of champions. In some ways, you saw this with Japan and the Kiretsu and South Korea with the Chaebol, the Chaebol and in those cases of these, these conglomerates that became champions, but in China, it wasn't necessarily in terms of conglomerates, but there was a very clear recognition and a desire to not only catch up, but actually become global leaders in certain areas and to invest the money, the resources, and time to help those industries and those companies. And China having that scale and that ability to do that was incredibly important, as well as honestly having the motivation, especially after they joined the World Trade Organization. I would also just wait one caveat. China considers itself a developing nation because it entered into the WTO that way. But there's no question that in many ways there are multiple Chinas and that coastal China is a developed nation. The main distinction is, is that the Chinese leadership wants to develop and utilize some of these platforms and technologies to reach underdeveloped parts of the country. Right. Uh, that's a great insight. Yeah, we all know that, you know, China is a, such a large country. So there's a quite a difference that depending upon that, the, what particular region that you're talking about. Now, uh, both of you briefly mentioned the digitalization of the economies in other Asian countries. Uh, how about India? And also, I'd like to ask you to elaborate and how come the Singapore has become the front runner? What are the, some of the strengths that, that, that enable the Singapore has become that, that you know, leader of this, this digitalization um, in Southeast Asia and maybe that the, in Asia um, the whole? Well, I guess I can go first uh, for a moment, uh, but Kevin, okay. please. Um, the, um, uh, I mean, I probably have more perhaps to say about Singapore than of India, but uh, we take the four parts of uh, that we're so we we were thinking about transactions, people, investment, and knowledge. Um, I, I think that the government again in Singapore plays a leading role in shaping the business environment. So uh, I've been very supportive of creating a, a, a e-commerce standards of uh, encouraging adoption. Uh, I was on a panel one time with uh, Olaf Scholz, actually, when he was the mayor of Hamburg, and I forget who from Singapore, was, uh, but they had a minister of digitalization, so the, whoever that person was, uh, and we were talking about fi uh, fintech and, uh, and, uh, and e-banking and the problems with the older demographic uh, 
you know, so, you know, well, grandma, how will, how will she deal with it? And so Olaf was saying things like, well, that's why we always maintain a human teller uh, in our bank branches so that, you know, that grandma will have someone to talk to when she goes to the bank to do her business. And the Singaporean minister looked very offended <laughs> at this comment and said, that's a completely wrong way of thinking. Uh, our, our policy is no grandma left behind, <laughs> that all grandmas will be able to go online and use, use e-banking. And if that means I have to send a teenager to sit next to grandma to help her figure that out, I will do that. <laughs> so, um, and so that was a, uh, so the government pushed to sort of enable all segments of the demographic to actually adopt this technology. Uh, I also had the conversation similar with the Estonian prime minister, Tomas Ilves, and when asked, you know, what was the secret of Estonia becoming a very digitally enabled country, perhaps the most in, in Europe? He said, well, we made it mandatory. <laughs> so it's like, you know, everybody has to have it. Uh, you, a digital ID is not optional. Uh, and uh, because if it was not mandatory, we would never get scale and nobody would develop the apps. Um, mm -hmm. So by, by creating an aggregating demand from an economic sense, government has essentially created a market uh, for yeah. people to go out there and develop digital technology. So I think that's a big reason on the transaction side and on the people side, I think just a whole of society effort to skill up and uh, lots of lots of adult learning, uh, which is what this is all about. Incidentally, this is really about helping people who over a certain age to use a new thing in their life. Um, and that's uh, that's that as we know, people adults do not learn necessarily by sitting in a room, but they 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 learn by practice. And so, uh, having employers support it, uh, having uh, you know every place you go, having an opportunity to try it, uh, the app or whatever that that makes a huge difference. And then finally, yes, investment. And I'd say this is one where obviously Singapore, as a smaller country, is not really able to invest in the same level, but they can certainly attract people who do. Uh, so having a, uh, so the role that the Economic Development Board of Singapore has played in attracting leading uh, global companies, along with the whole proposition of Singapore Inc., um, is is also something that's quite distinctive. Um, so that's you know those are some of the factors. But I don't think Singapore would necessarily call itself a digital leader in the sense of the place that you would go to you know see the latest newest uh, te technology. But what they would say is they are a digitally enabled society. Um, they are a society that uses digital technology to advance quickly. And in that regard, maybe we could call them a digital leader. So, Yeah, I suspect probably the government has played a big role mm -hmm. because to the best of my knowledge, one of the major concerns for the Singapore is a lack of entrepreneurship. Everything is mm -hmm. pretty much led by the government in the past. You, you, thought, you mentioned the Singapore Inc., that was, uh, you know, the mainly actually managed uh, by the, the the government, um, you know, previous prime minister Lee Kuan Yew and the successor and etc. So I was a little bit surprised because that uh, Singapore they are always concerned about the lack of entrepreneurship in the private sector, but now that at least as you mentioned they are not the leader but uh, they are enabler. So I I think I understand your point. Now Kevin, is there anything that you want to add? Well, I mean, yeah, two things just I just to add in terms of Singapore, which I think is important. I mean, you know, both you and Jonathan have talked about the the role of the government. I think it's incredibly significant in Singapore. I would also describe it in many ways that Singapore is a digital platform country in many ways is that they're using the digital reach, particularly from a financial standpoint, financial services and otherwise, to extend their leverage and basically we describe it hit it above hit above their own weight, so to speak, uh, and that they are in a situation where they are utilizing this strength in the ability to build alliances and to be a hub for financial services and leverage that aspect to give them a greater reach. Singapore has stalled numerous times in trying to attract talent and to develop homegrown entrepreneurship, as Jonathan said, is that that's never been something they've done incredibly well. This comes back to that whole issue of risk and the issue for you know, where California tends to shine, but it's been able to use the government side and this financial services side to do really well. Uh, in India, it's interesting in contrast, the Indian government in much more recently has tried to intervene and play a larger role in terms of uh, signing deals, actively encouraging investment, incurring, uh, you know, bringing in manufacturing. But India is in an interesting situation. They're not viewed 
either in terms of the manufacturing skills, nor are they viewed from a an R and D standpoint is becoming and playing a leading role in chip design or manufacturing or even doing the highest end chips. They're viewed as like that low, you know, a lot of sort of the cheaper chips that quite honestly are incredibly necessary. They draw, you know, they go in our cars, they go in our uh, our microwaves, they go in our in our all sorts of in devices you can't even begin to imagine. And you need somebody to basically manufacture and work those. And India has the potential to scale up. But ultimately, India is sort of an even more extreme version than China in terms of where the digital, uh, the R&D is, where the technology is, where the human capital is. And a lot of that concentration is particularly in the south of India. I mean, we hear a lot about Bengaluru and, it, and its very in its role, but it is important to realize that, that sort of that divide between the south and the rest of the country when it comes to di the digital side, we see it in particularly in outsourcing of services, but we see it in terms of where the money is and where the activity is, that it's located in a few specific areas in the country. And there is incredible disparity in terms of not only where the digital manufacturing R&D and other elements are, but also in even the human capital, but also even when it comes to digital payments and the digital infrastructure, where it's penetrated more effectively and how much further it needs to go in the rest of the country. Great. Uh, now I'd like to pick up some questions from the audience. Uh, we have a lot of questions. So um, let's go to the uh, Professor Francisco Valle. Actually, this was one of the, the questions I prepared. Uh, so I'm going to just read that uh, his questions. So uh, this question is addressed to Jonathan, but I think that the Kevin can also that uh, jump to the um, you know discussion. Uh, thank you for sharing your expertise and insights with us. How does the U.S. companies to major economies in Asia, based on your four components index, four metrics you mentioned that the you know, transaction, people, and etc. And what can the U.S. could do to improve uh, our ranking? So. I think that he's basically asking how does that uh, uh, the U.S. and also the state of California fare. Um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis these the four major economies that we covered uh, in, in Asia. Right. Well, um, I think that I'm going to, first of all, suggest that this is something of a moving picture. And uh, we should, uh, you know, we should recognize that, you know, things can change quite quickly. Uh, but overall, still the U.S. is the world's uh, leading global economy. Um, uh, yes, st still. But in terms of the size and 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 depth of the economy, it's it's obviously the world's largest. Uh, still, uh, China's rising fast, but it by no means is it. You know, can can we say that it is the it, it is the center for the global economy? Maybe for growth um, is what I think the U.S. economy needs to focus on. So, like, how will the U.S. Uh, restart, if you will, the growth and productivity engine that got it to be uh, the world's largest uh, economy. And uh, in terms of deployment and adoption, that's of, te of technologies, that's where, of course, we do start to see, um, relatively speaking, a, a lag. Um, a couple of things that we might point out uh, in terms of what uh, what could be different for, for the U.S. So on transactions, uh, the so the number of transactions is obviously smaller than a place like China. Um, so it's but it's really about adoption that we we should see high we, we should see more. Now during COVID we saw a big uptick, frankly, um, of particularly on the retail side in the U.S., but still a lot of resistance and and you know sectors of the economy which are still using cash or plastic, as uh, as Kevin was saying for Japan also true in many parts of the U.S. Um, on the people side, I think the U.S. is, of course, strong at, uh, in terms of its uh, capacities at, at the tertiary level in universities. Uh, this is nothing new, new to say. It's uh, it, the weakness is at the K through 12 um, and particularly at STEM graduates uh, coming out of out of high school. And so that that is our STEM focused programs at, at the high school level. So that that I think is another area for focus. Um, I should also note that, you know, the the ability to retain the talent is increasingly a question um, and sort of how 
uh, once graduated from uh, the STEM program in a, in a university or a PhD, how many of those uh, PhDs stay in the U.S. is uh, is a question, and their ability to stay and, and work in, in the U.S. Is, a, is obviously subject to regulatory constraints. Um, on the investment side, that's the probably the single biggest challenge going forward. It says U.S. is sitting on an incredible installed base, if you will, or wealth of historic investments, asset, you know, whether it's in the university setting or in or in corporate environments. But the rate of new investments, the the flow of new investments, has been slowing. And I think that's uh, that particularly in digital areas that uh, the the willingness to spend on digital infrastructure in particular is something of a, you know, it would be an aspect of, of what we should do more of. Um, and then finally, that translates uh, into knowledge as in the form of patents and companies. In many ways, that's a bit of an outcome. Uh, but I think that the environment that supports uh, startups, I mean, that that where the U.S. has always excelled. And so Silicon Valley, obviously, Route 128, um, a number of other Silicon Forest, if you will, Silicon everything. Uh, so that's uh, Silicon Beach here in, in L.A. Uh, but uh, these these are. Uh, relatively speaking, uh, at this point, you know, not as compelling as they were in the past. So the in terms of the rate of new of new capital and new unicorn formation has slowed, uh, and I think that's something to to keep an eye on. So, you know, this is a this is a race. It's not a you know, and and it's a it's an ongoing one. There's plenty of opportunities to uh, to accelerate progress, uh, but and the and the people who are in front are those who run faster. Uh, so I think that the, the general message to the U.S. audience is that this is competitive. Uh, we do need to run faster. There are some particular gaps in, in these, these, these aspects, but nothing that isn't solvable uh, with the right set of policies and initiatives. Right. You know, as you know, that LMU is in the heart of the Silicon Beach. So we hope that we can produce that the talent so that uh, we can contribute to the, you know, enhancing competitiveness of the U.S. businesses in the world in this mm -hmm. direction. Kevin, is there anything that you want to add? We do have a yeah, lot well, of I, questions, so would you please well, quickly comment? Yeah. All right. Well, I'll do, I'll do a fairly quick one, and we, we'll see how many questions we get to. But the, the most important thing I would say here in terms of California in particular, and let alone the U.S., is still that entrepreneurial side, that ability to create companies, to create technology spinoffs is incredibly significant. We fund them, we develop them. The main issues you run into, and we see this in waves in the US, is that the you certain times regulations come in that favor the companies who are already established, which is one of the reasons we sometimes have pushes in to develop completely new markets. We saw this early on with cell phones. We've seen this in terms of, you know, we saw this in terms of some of the digital payment side, you know, including even companies like PayPal. We've seen this in terms of r and d in especially where that's come in, the catch is, will the economy allow for the small companies to grow into the mid-sized one, the large ones, which is really what drives not only a significant amount of economic growth, but really a lot of the innovation, the technological space. And it, Jonathan mentioned the issue in terms of policies and immigration. That's been a huge impediment, particularly in California. Because one of the tremendous advantages that comes in and why you see a lot of this is people come not only for the universities and the research opportunities, but they come to the U.S. because of the U.S. acceptance of new things in risk, California in particular, not just in terms of the capital, but also in terms of the larger entrepreneurial infrastructure that exists and that you've seen competition with California develop in, in the silicons all over places all over the country. And we've seen a number of them have done incredibly well and some have not. But what ultimately that's insignificant here in terms of driving the digital side as well is that when the regulations tend to be on more on the conservative side, and we've seen you know attempts to push on this in cryptocurrencies, we've seen some of this in terms of fintech, but ultimately the issue that you 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 run into is how do you enable these new sectors and this innovation, this competition on the digital side to so the U.S. can stay ahead without you know creating large enough risks that you blow up existing institutions or otherwise, and it's a it's a balancing act. Singapore can do it because it's a small nation state and it can intervene in very real ways and it can rely on others to do sort of the heavy lifting and then do better at implementation. 
for us, it, it, a lot of this in terms of STEM and a lot of this in terms of outreach is creating those pipelines that go early on, recognizing and creating pathways for, you know, for kids early in their lives to not think math is hard, science is hard, but actually look at it and saying, I want to do that. And one of the major things that we've had as a problem in the U.S. is that we had relied on the Cold War and the space race for a very long time to help drive and bring in domestic talent. And we need to recognize that that global competition and communicate that uh, all the way up and down and the opportunities that it creates in order to drive a lot of that more that innovation and that desire in the U.S. population to actually embrace and push forward. All right, thanks. Uh, let me go to the next question. I found this question uh, kind of interesting. Do you think Asia's position as the international leader in digital payments and for the investment into CBDC uh, CBDCs like the uh, digital yuan could threaten the U.S. dollar position in the global economy? Who wants to touch on this? <laughs> well, I'm happy to say a few things. Um, the uh, well, CBDCs have not really um, materialized, at least in China, where I can speak of right now. I mean, I think that the idea around the CBDC was that this would be a way of targeting monetary policy so that we could turn on the money here, but not there. <laughs> so specific groups, subsidies could be tar could be addressed and that you would also have transparency. So it, it would create perhaps better revenue, uh, impact revenue leakage as, as, a, as it uh, diplomatically is called. Um, so uh, that in other words, the government would have greater uh, abilities to uh, a greater level of uh, toolkit, uh, so some some more 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 ability to deploy policy and to uh, enhance efficiency of what government is supposed to do. Um, that I think was the goal. Uh, we've seen some pilots, um, but you know, basically people still use WeChat and Alipay. <laughs> so I mean, so as far as digital currency goes, it's quite firmly in the control of the private sector at this point um and uh, which is wild if you think about it it's like you know the, the the tender for for most common transactions is no longer a state intermediated tender it is <laughs> it is in fact a private currency uh, but uh that's 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 how technology works and so government i think is now sort of looking at this and saying well interesting you know how do we achieve our goals uh, for a, a digital currency, as in the ability to target monetary policy and to minimize revenue leakage uh, without actually having to become a currency platform again ourselves. So because they've realized that the business of being a currency platform is something that requires a not insubstantial technological endowment, uh, which apparently um, the banking system of China is not quite up for. <laughs> so um, so to, it's a little bit to be de determined, but I, I I don't see it yet happening. I don't know, Kevin, you have thoughts on this? <laughs> no, my, my, I think it, my uh, mirror yours, uh, the main step I would add on to that is that ultimately the issue is convertibility. Uh, that when you're dealing with any kind of digital currency, including a central bank's one or otherwise, you have to look at it in terms of, you know, what is it capable of replacing and how is it capable of being used? And what you consistently find in every attempt to create a digital currency in the same way that you see uh, some of the limit, uh, number of limitations on the one in general is that issue of convertibility. The real reason in many ways that people but accept the one and want you know the RMB is because of the fact that it is a backed by the China the, the the massive Chinese economy the Chinese purchasing power the Chinese government, but at the same time because it's not fully convertible it's also a limiter in that you can only use it in certain places in certain circumstances a digital currency even takes it a step further and. What you ultimately need in terms of, you know, I would say in terms of the threat to the dollar, the biggest threat to the dollar is the dollar. It's actually, you know, it's U it's U.S. fiscal policy, it's U.S. limitations in terms of that. And to some extent, you know, how the U.S. has taken advantage of being the reserve currency. But at the same time, that issue in terms of how you can effectively transactionalize and utilize that currency and the fact that Jonathan noted that even in China, that there have been limits because people didn't want to move in that direction. 
means in that they're using what is the greatest utility. And if you can't break into that and demonstrate that great utility, you're always going to find only a limited use case. Yeah, I, I just one last thing. I mean, I the other part of the, the question, um, fintech, though, is a different thing. Fintech is much broader than CBDCs. And, and China is the fintech universe of the you know platform of the world, particularly for mass adoption. Uh, so I think that is something of an in its own industry. And uh, yeah, China is going to be a leader in that. Uh, I think the U.S. leads in wealth management services still because of uh, the much larger size of the population of the wealthy people, um, relatively speaking. But that will change, too. Um, and uh, wealthy people tend to be a bit younger in China. Maybe that will help on the adoption side as well. Um, so watch the space, but it's competitive, just like every other industry, for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. And as you oh. see more and more wealthy people in Asia, and you see more of them setting a trend on that, you expect that a number of the services will adapt and change to fit that as well. We're running out of time, so I want to bundle the three questions together and ask you the questions uh, from Professor Lee and Park, and also the similar questions from Valentina Cuesta. So far, we've talked about the pros or the benefits of digitalization, but they're concerned about the downside of the digitalization, for example, at the societal level on income inequality and social disparity. So we know that uh, it might take some jobs away from the people. And also some of these people are concerned about at the organizational level, you know, there might be a concern about the data privacy. Uh, we all know that, uh, you know, cybersecurity is a big concern and government surveillance on online activities uh, and et cetera. So how do you think that, that we can balance can you see any kind of solutions or the alternatives so that we can at least mitigate this kind of risk? Well, my managing risk is like a bicycle. <clears throat> um, go too fast, you crash. Go too slow, you also crash. <laughs> so stopping this is not a good idea because uh, you are literally in motion. Um, so every year in the Chinese manufacturing sector, uh, you have roughly 30 to 5 to 40 percent job turnover. Um, but yet the total employment is flat. So what that means is 20% of jobs are being created and 20% of jobs are being destroyed. <laughs> so you can't just look at the one number, the destruction, without also noting the, the other number, the creation. And uh, so the, the idea about the bicycles, you may have to pedal a bit harder, <laughs> as in, you know, we have to focus on the job creation, which is a bit challenging because we know what jobs we're losing. We don't know what jobs we're creating. Uh, every time when we have a technological revolution, we create a whole bunch of jobs and things that literally did not exist before. So uh, we take the you know the, the the steam engine or you know the the highway system. Yes, the the, the horse and buggy manufacturers did not survive, <laughs> but on the other hand, we got Howard Johnsons um, and uh, roadside roadside tourism, which we did not have before. So uh, all of these things are sort of a little bit more about envisioning the future that you want and having a lot of faith that you can cushion the transition uh, with the relative with with uh, you know the impacts on uh, on the individual. Because to be clear, society is a lot better able to take risk than an individual is. Uh, so if there's a takeaway for this is that the great risk shift that we've had in the United States over the last 30 years away from society taking risk to individuals taking risk makes us unprepared for a technological transition. <laughs> so in Asia, that societal transition is enabled by risk sharing. Risk sharing because investments are often taken by the state. Uh, they're intermediated by the state and because there is simply uh, a more a lower cost base in some cases. I think that's a lot what it happens is that you can still manage to make your job transition without it becoming this catastrophic impact on your life. And I'm, I'm vastly generalizing here, but that's that's the safety net. But there's no question that Asia needs to do more. You know, as we go forward, that safety net will have to be reinforced and particularly a place like China. Uh, which formally really doesn't have one. There is no unemployment insurance. So there is no uh, social security. There, there, there is no, uh, you know, Medicare, it's on you. Uh, so, I mean, they said the saving grace of China is that things are cheap, so you can save a lot. And so people do, <laughs> and that's the safety net. But, you know, that's going to run out too. So I think that's this, these formal mechanisms need to be put in place. 
I won't talk too much about the privacy other than to say like, yeah, every regulator deals with this in their own way. And we absolutely have to have to pay attention to the expectations of privacy. So, but I'm aware of time, Kevin. So. Yeah. So my me, me thoughts is that every time the technology, the technology advances, particularly on the information side, you run the risk of exposure. We, in fact, share so much information, uh, not only in terms of you know, we, you know, every day you hear news stories about social media and various ways to capture data, share it and monetize it. But you also see and recognize, run into more broadly the fact that there are issues in terms of, as Jonathan said, you know, the, the, the balance between regulation and the technological change. I'd also note that if you're looking at it in terms of the effect on the middle class, which is something that you know, we all very much care about, not only in China, and the, but very much in the U.S. and automation, is that uh, in the U.S., manufacturing employment peaked in 1979. And one of the reasons it has been in a decline since then is because automation was and the speeding up of processes and the technological disruption that was happening in some ways led by the Japanese back in the 70s and 80s and otherwise being led in terms of overall uh, the way that businesses operated and a shift away from heavy manufacturing in many cases competition that was going on in terms of pricing and otherwise that affected the garment industry and everywhere else way before China entered the WTO has been affecting the U.S. and affecting, and affecting the middle class. The real thing you need to look at is that where China had succeeded and was actively using manufacturing and using other ways was that it was using the levelers both in terms of targeted education and the state linking businesses and education to create opportunities and to move people up, particularly through manufacturing, in the same way that the U.S. really had sort of running from the 1920s and through the 1970s. In moving past that manufacturing to a post-manufacturing economy, especially as your population is aging, is hard. And it's something that China is going to have to face in the same way that Japan already faced, in the way that Korea is facing front and center right now. In the U.S., the real issue is, is that it's not just automation. It's the real, it's the pressures in general on wages and the fact that wages have stagnated for decades and that ultimately what we're seeing and we're worried about is that efficient uh, technological changes is going to hit what is many cases sort of middle class, upper middle class service related jobs and other elements in that and being able to stay ahead of that and to create new opportunities and to ensure that those are there for the next generation is going to be incredibly important. And that ultimately, you know, the educational attainment levels you need aren't necessarily about everybody getting a PhD. In many cases, they're about getting applied training and being able to do the technical jobs, two-year skill, uh, uh, college jobs, technical certifications that still go with the digital economy, that go with these new advanced manufacturing elements and otherwise. And if we can step ahead of it and recognize that that's something that Asia has been doing better, that India is even in many ways doing better, and that we really need in the U.S. to do better, that's going to be one of the key uh, abilities and key enablers of being able to work with and stay ahead on the digital economy. Okay, uh, unfortunately, you know, we ran out of time. Um, so I'm sorry uh, to the audience that they were not able to get to all the questions uh, you posted. Thanks again, Kevin and Jonathan, for talking to LMD community out of your very busy schedule. And I hope that your you know, meeting goes well um, in DC and Seoul, Korea. So we really appreciate sharing your knowledge and insights into the digitalization of the Asian economy. Finally, I'd like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope that you have enjoyed the program. We'll be back with another program in November. So please stay safe and healthy until then. Before you leave, I would really appreciate if you can complete a brief survey at the end of the webinar. Thank you so much, everyone. And good night, good afternoon, and good morning, depending on where you are. Thank you so much. Thanks again.